You know what's been missing from the world of hungry caterpillars, spot and cat in the hats? Yeah. Lessons about artificial intelligence. Oh, is that right? <laughs> Thankfully, Professor Michael Milford from the Queensland University of Technology is changing all that. He's also a chief investigator at the Australian Centre for Robotic Vision. We spoke to him last year about robots and his passion for educating kids about STEM. I remember that. It was fascinating. I do too, and I'm pleased to say we're going to chat to him again because he's created a picture book, The Complete Guide to Artificial Intelligence for Kids. It introduces the concepts of artificial intelligence and the science behind it to kids using pictures and relatable examples. And Michael Milford joins us now on Talking Technology. G'day, Michael. How are you going? Mate, very well. So, I mean, how do you teach young kids about artificial intelligence? Well, you practice on your own kids, first of all, and you see how it works. <laughs> how old are they, mate? Work. i got a five-year-old son and a three-year-old daughter. Okay. And, and what do you end up works. with? Uh, you end up with uh, some, some explanations, some nice pictures that they really like, uh, and you get, up, you get come up with a pretty comprehensive sort of introduction to AI. What are the kids, uh, what are your kids like at the playground? Um, playground conversation must be a bit different <laughs> when they're educated on artificial uh, no, intelligence. Yeah. They're normal feral kids running around screaming, very, very normal. And what made you want to do this then? Because let's be honest, uh, a kid's book, uh, Andy Lee's book about don't turn the page, that's the kind of crazy thing that my kids want to just go, don't turn the page, oh, let's turn the page, don't turn the page. So why on earth are you thinking that you need to even begin the process of educating kids on artificial intelligence? So so you know in your previous chat you're talking about uh, being lazy and doing your laundry, right? And, and I'm an expert. And most people, yeah, yeah, so most people try and find a way. It sort of started out that way. So my, my son knows I work with robots. So uh, more recently, he's been asking, oh, what do you do, Dad? What do you do with robots and all that sort of stuff? So, mm. of course, rather than explain it to him myself, I went and looked and went, oh, maybe there's a video or a book I can show him which will explain it all. Uh, and Parenting 101 in 20, <laughs> 2018. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't anything I could find, especially for little kids, and especially about like things like artificial intelligence, possibly because it's a little bit more nebulous than a robot. Uh, so I, I just put it together, and I've, I've been doing that on and off for the last 17 years, so I've been practiced at it uh, and and tested it with them and sort of refined it and and got out something i was pretty happy with so why do you think it's important to be teaching kids certainly i mean for your kids it's great because i know this the feeling it's it's very hard as a parent to not be able to explain to your kids or for your kids not to be able to explain to their friends what mum and dad do so yeah. i can see why you do it but that's fine you can print it on a printer and staple it together and the kids can read the book why do you go to the trouble of making a book that other people's kids can use why do you think it's important that we teach kids about it look i think it's supremely important i think making everyone aware about sort of big technological change uh, that's happening in this world uh, is critical because this is going to affect our kids way more than it's going to affect us um, old people uh, and and they're going to have to know how to cope in this world they're going to have to know how to sort of take opportunities seize opportunities uh, and they're going to have to see through all the hype um, about good things and bad things that will come with things like artificial intelligence. So that's really what the book's about. Demystify it, empower them to sort of start thinking about these things, but in a sort of kid-friendly way. We're not doing algorithms or equations or any of that rubbish at this stage. So under your, I think it's called Maths Thrills brand, you run a bunch of cool events for kids to teach them about STEM in a, in a fun way. Um, yep. I think we talked before about like diffusing a nuclear reactor before a timer goes off, but you also run corporate events for adults. So what do you do in events like Maths in the Movies? So Maths in the Movies is great with adults because we no longer have to be politically correct. We can talk about violence and we can talk about bombs. So that gives us a lot more leeway uh, to explore sort of mathematical and scientific concepts. So like an event we did at World Science Festival uh, late last uh, Last year, uh, we went through the movie Speed, where the bus jumps the gap in the highway. Ah. Uh, we went through card counting in movies like The Hangover and Rain Man uh, <laughs> and, and stuff like that. And we really got into it. We got people counting cards and showed them that it was actually pretty easy. Uh, and then we sent them across to the casino, across the river. Just kidding. And, uh, <laughs> and, and we got people uh, cracking codes on this sort of mock, mock bombs. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. Well, so in a corporate environment, I've done a lot of those corporate things where you try and start a day or end a day to keep you engaged. You're doing these things. What is the what is the motivation behind doing this kind of thing at a corporate event? Um, there'd be a few, right? So one is 
getting people thinking a little bit outside the box. So a lot of the corporate events that you see are really about getting people to step back from the grind of their job and, and do something a little bit different, whether it's a building a bridge out of spaghetti uh, or cracking the code for a bomb. What, the, the key is to get people um, sort of in a different frame of mind and then to have them sort of think a little bit about what they do in their job, for instance, but from a very different perspective. Now, you're, if your area of expertise includes robots, as far as we've come, there have been some pretty darn disappointing robots right here at CES. I'm in Las <laughs> Vegas right now. Yep. I've seen things from uh, a little thing called Buddy, which just looks like a, a thing with an iPad on its face. Um, I've seen, uh, you know, I guess you call them humanoid-looking robots. You've got Sophia with a, you know, a real-looking face who's getting a, a citizenship in places. I don't think anyone's getting it right. Um, you know, there were some robots today I saw that claimed to be involved in elder care, in other words, for companionship and monitoring. Why, why are robots so ill-defined right now? And is there anyone getting it right? So, oh, you're giving robots a bad name, man. So, <laughs> it, it's, you've got to understand the climate that we live in. So, the climate with companies and startups is such that you're really encouraged to sort of push the boundaries, maybe get an 85% complete product out in front of the market because if you're not seen to be sort of leading the field, then maybe your share price will tank. Uh, and and wow. you can see it in the number of sort of dodgy demos that occur regularly at these sort of technology events. Uh, mm. It's just the sort of the, the market at the moment encourages that sort of behavior rather than waiting 10 years until it's perfect because by then you've got no money because the investors have all gone elsewhere. So what, what, what robots excite you then? What have you seen that actually makes you go, even though it's 30% or 80% done, what is the stuff that excites you out there? Look, I'm really, really lazy and really, really selfish. And there were actually, as far as I know, there was at least two laundry folding robots that um, CES, right? Did you see the other one? Uh, I saw one a couple of years ago. I haven't seen the second one, though, this year. So apparently the second one, and, and I'm just reporting what I read, is a little bit more hush-hush, but it's one of the ones where you sort of do hand it off completely to the, the robotic system, uh, and it takes about 10 minutes to fold a shirt. Uh, it can only fold bright coloured shirts at the moment, but that's really exciting because you could just leave that going all day and you come home and your laundry is all folded and that would be awesome. Mm, oh, it's one of those ones that needs to be at 90%. I want to see it working for a day before I trust it. Working for a day. Yeah, but they'll, they'll get better real quick. Uh, and that's a that's a big market. There's a lot of lazy middle class people who, who would pay for that, I would think. Michael, at the moment when we're talking about uh, robots, we mostly think in the science fiction vein of them. They somewhat resemble a human or they roll around trying to do the manual tasks that we normally do. We're also at the same time seeing the emergence of artificial intelligence, which you've written a book about, and things like Google Home and Amazon Electra and those home uh, service kits, the personal assistant things. Mm. Is it more realistic that those kinds of robots are going to be more impactful than the sci-fi film robots? Physical-looking yeah. things. Yeah. yeah, so anything that involves complex hardware, which is most of the sci-fi robots, they're incredibly difficult, and the rate of progress is much slower. The real sort of society transforming stuff will revolve around data and AI and that's why these things like Google Home and Alexa are potentially just going to transform everything because they, first of all, they collect a lot of data and second of all, they enable you to interact with all the data of the world uh, very easily. So that's, that's where the biggest changes will come initially. Well, I'm, I'm okay with my robot vacuum. I've, I've, I've decided that the one that I've got is, is doing an okay job, and I think that's taken years to get to that point. And I think your point is don't, don't dismiss them early. Just consider that they will get better, and they'll get better fast. Yep, and just watch out for your robot vacuum spying on what products you leave around your house and then sending you targeted uh, email advertising. I'm good with that. I love targeted ads better than getting rubbish ads. That's my view. Uh, Michael Milford, thanks for your time, mate, and good luck uh, with everything that you're doing in this field. Thanks, it's been great. There we are. Jeez, it's so interesting, isn't it? The the, it the is. knowledge that people like Michael have in this sector, it does make you feel a little bit excited about the future. Oh, no, and rather I, than scared, Look, I'm massively excited. Don't, don't yeah. get me wrong. I'm not a hater of robots. I just... Mm. The problem is in this in this world and with the, the way the media works, um, and you know we're involved in it. Yeah. The media want to see that you know that robot Rosie from the Jetsons. Yes. The media want to see the complete package, and so the wimpy the disappointment, one from Lost in Space. Maybe not. The disappointment Dexter can be overwhelming. From perfect match. 
Dexter from Perfect Match. No, yeah. we don't need that either. We've got Tinder. Yeah, true. Trevor, you know, you know there are those musical cards and you open it up and it plays Happy Birthday yep. when you open yep. it. Well, mm. I, I just learnt that um, there's going to be an edition of Michael's book that's a, a musical book and when you open it up, it's got this as its theme. <laughs> Uh, licensed. We've licensed it out. Michael loved it. I'm sure he did. And (laughs) I hope he's not putting that in his book.